John, physicists talk about a theory of everything. Theologians talk about the existence of God. But really, there's a question that's even more fundamental than both of those. And that's, why anything at all? Why is there something rather than absolutely nothing? That was Leibniz's great question. I think it's a very profound question. But the world seems to divide into two groups of people. Those who, like me, think that is a very profound question. Others who can't see the point of the question. I mean, here we are, good heavens, what are, what are, we, what are, we, what are we worrying about? I think, it, I think it is a deep question. And interestingly, it's the question that the theological doctrine of creation is really seeking to address. The doctrine of creation isn't concerned with how, simply how things began. It isn't the, answering the question, who lit the blue touch paper of the Big Bang? It is trying to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Why does this world exist in its character, its fruitfulness, its order, its strangeness, and so on? And the theological answer is that the world exists, is given being by God, who is an a, a entity that doesn't need to be given being because God has being in himself. The theologians call it aseity. In other words, God is his own cause. We need a cause to hold us in being. I believe, actually, that if, if God withdrew the divine will to hold the world in being, the world would disappear. We can't do the ultimate experiment and see whether that happens, but that's, that, that, that would be it. So the, the, answer, the answer, I think, is why there's something rather than nothing, is that, that God, out of love and generosity, has decided to bring into being entities other than the divine self itself. And that's, that, that's why and God brings them into being, and holds them into being, and cares for them in well, their being. The argument is, though, that what you're doing is really kicking the problem up one level. It's the same problem, but now instead of dealing with why are there physical laws and forces and particles, right. you're, you're dealing why is there a God, and you're as assigning a saity or self-existence right. to God. Right. Somebody else can assign self-existence to what we see here, and at least what we see here we can see and we can't see God. Well, that's the child's question, who made God? I, I, I agree, and it's an awkward, awkward question. But if you understand the meaning of the word, word God, as it's used anyway in, in Christian theology, and I think more widely in other theologies, it does include in its very definition. It doesn't seem to be incoherent to believe that there could be an entity that is its own self-cause. And that if there is such an entity, then as Aquinas would say, that all people call God. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I, I think... I think that that's it. I mean, everybody, I mean, every metaphysical scheme about the world, every general scheme about the world has to take some given brute fact oh, yes. on which it builds the, its edifice of explanation. And in the Western thinking, there are basically two, two um, metaphysical traditions. Uh, one is theism, which takes as its brute fact a self-existent God, the way I've been trying to indicate. The alternative, of course, is materialism. And it takes its brute fact uh, in the uh, simply saying the laws of nature, the properties of matter. That's the brute fact, and we build everything upon that. Now, I would say that that second stance is unsatisfactory because when we look at the properties of matter, we find, first of all, that they are wonderfully ordered. I mean, it's hard work doing research in physics. One of the rewards is the feeling of wonder, some new aspect of the marvelous wonder of the world is basic structure of the world is revealed to, to our inquiry. The laws of physics are always written in what mathematicians can recognize and agree about as being beautiful equations. There is, a, there is a, a, a wonderful order in the world, and of course, an amazing fruitfulness in the world. I mean, the laws of nature um, are, are such that they have turned what initially was just a ball of energy into a, a universe which includes saints and scientists among its inhabitants. It seems to me the laws of nature have a character that doesn't make them satisfactory just to be taken as brute facts. They seem to point beyond themselves in their order, their fruitfulness. And I see that, I see that as pointing towards the mind of a creator and the purpose of a creator. Many scientists would point to multiple universes as showing that not only are there cycles, but that the whole sequence is virtually infinite or perhaps literally infinite, so that you have no need for anything intervening as, as, a, as a, an initial cause. And before the Big Bang, there was chaotic inflation and other universes branching off, and so the whole system, in their view, would be um, internally consistent. Well, there are interesting speculative theories about that, but again, of course, they're taking something as brute fact. Suppose that internal inflation is correct, 
um, then you, you need general relativity, you need quantum mechanics. They don't come for nothing. They are natural things that have to be there. You have, you have to ask, why is there quantum theory rather than something else? Why is there general relativity rather than something else? That doesn't really, doesn't really solve, solve the problem. In, 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 in my view. Moreover, just having an infinite array of universes doesn't mean to say you're going to get all the necessary properties. I mean, there are an infinite number of even, even numbers. Yes. None of them has the property of being odd. <laughs> you can have an infinite number of universes, but none of them have the pretty very specific, fine-tuned character that our universe has, which you know is necessary for it to, to um, uh, evolve carbon-based life. I'm not saying there couldn't be other universes. I mean, I'm not, not for me to limit God's creative generosity. If God wants to make other universes, uh, then that's up to God, God, God to do that. But I think that, um, that, uh, if there are lots of other universes, it's up to God to choose to do that if God wishes to do that. But we should also remember that those other universes are essentially not scientific hypotheses. They're unobservable by us. They, they are conjectural in that sense. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, though, aren't we dealing with one kind of brute fact or another? Yes. The brute fact of God as having self-existence right. and the brute fact of the material world, the laws of physics, right. as having some kind of brute fact self-existence. Right. Is, that, is that our absolute alternative? Is that what we have, one or the other? Certainly in Western thinking, those have been the two broad alternatives that have been considered. And what I'm arguing is that the... The laws of nature have a character that doesn't make them a satisfactory stopping point in this, this, this backward, backward argument. Yeah. But the idea of a self, ex, self existent being, uh, with, with divine power and divine purpose, and divine mind, that does seem to me a satisfactory stopping point. But in the end of the day, that, 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 that is, that is the issue. Also, I mean, I do think that, that, um, a reductive materialism, which says we're well, just a collection of atoms and molecules, it doesn't explain a very large number of things about about our hu human. It doesn't explain our our personal experiences and our experiences of value and, and beauty.